Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about the definitions of race and ethnicity and what it means to say that race is socially constructed. We're also going to be talking about what minority status means and how that affects your life chances. To begin with, race, the idea of race is that race is based upon biological traits, biological differences between groups of people. Ethnicity is based upon culture. Culture meaning a common way of life, such as language, religion, country of origin, value systems, ideologies, for example. So again, when we're talking about race, we're talking about biological differences between people. When we're talking about ethnicity, we're talking about cultural differences between people. To understand what it means to say that race is socially constructed, I generally like to take a biopsychosocial approach to this, and then we'll also apply the sociological theories. So, from a biological perspective, do all black people, for example, have the same genetics in common? Do all white people have similar genetics in common? And the answer is no. That is a myth. Our racial categories do not accurately group people according to biological differences. A white person in America has more genetically in common than the average person in Africa than they do to their white next door neighbor. And this is something that I still struggle to wrap my mind around because again, I'm not a geneticist. I'm the philosopher professor, but I have to understand a bit about biology and genetics in order to really understand race. And so the geneticists say that we need more difference within groups than we do between, between groups. Therefore, Europeans, for example, needed to be more different than other Europeans than they actually need to be to people in Africa, for example. So the idea that all white people share common genetics is completely inaccurate. Now, to say that race doesn't exist, that's a little bit more of a struggle because there are some genetic you know, similarities between people, but we would need to create thousands of races to be able to count for all the genetic differences between different types of people. Okay, so again, is there a biological basis for race? Yes, but our categories, our racial categories, do not accurately group people according to biological differences. Therefore, we need to be looking at the categories themselves and saying, okay, where do racial categories come from? And here, because race is not a permanent structure of society, it's something that actually was just recently invented over the last several centuries, race came during the age of colonialism. Europe came over to the United States, which is now the United States, in Latin America, in Canada, to the Americas, and they wanted to maintain an upper class position. So Europeans wanted to remove competition. Women already were not allowed to compete. So they already had one minority group, half of the planet, that couldn't compete for elite jobs. Europeans wanted to go further and make very clear who could get a job and who could rise up the social class ladder and who was to be subjugated into a minority status. So what do Europeans have in common? light-colored skin. So Europeans one day out of nowhere, and this is the social construction of race, decided that Europeans were white and non-Europeans were non-white. So your original races were white and non-white. The purpose of race, why that was made in the first place, is economics. It's money. Europeans didn't want people to compete for jobs. They didn't want people competing for power. They wanted to maintain a dominant status position in society. So they already subjugated women, and then they went even further and subjugated all non-Europeans into minority statuses and came up with racial categories as the criteria for who could be in what social class and when. So the origin of race, the social construction of race was for economic purposes. Europeans wanted to stratify, to divide society into social classes, those who can have, those who cannot, the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat. So they created racial categories so you had a very clear, concise method for deciding who was allowed to become bourgeoisie and who was stuck as a proletariat. Hence the idea that not all white people have privilege, but white people have access to privilege. Okay? Now we have to think about how the social construction of race and how the socialization and having a culture of race 
And racism influences the way people think. How does it affect the psychology? How does it affect the way people think? How does it affect the way they behave, for example? So again, the biopsychosocial approach is, are there biological differences between people? If there are, do our racial categories accurately uh, categorize those people? Where does race come from? Who socially constructed race? Again, for economic purposes. And then, how does the experience of race influence the subjective you know, experience of race for individuals? So, the major themes of this class are going to be the minority experience, the subjective minority experience, okay? Now, the other theme of this class is going to be these systems of privilege, power, and oppression that maintain power for European descendants that remove competition for other people. And then how does prejudice and discrimination affect other people? How is prejudice and discrimination associated with your ability to rise up the social class? Ladder, okay? So again, the origin of inequality is the meanings attached to difference. So once Europeans decided that they were different than non-Europeans, and then they created racial categories, that in itself did not create inequality between groups. What created inequality between the groups were the meanings attached to the difference. Okay, what meanings were attached to white? What meanings were attached to non-white? Okay, and then when we look at modern racial categories, you also need to be asking a lot of questions. For example, is someone from North Africa white? According to the U.S. Census, yes. Is someone from the Middle East white? According to the U.S. Census, yes. Is someone from India Asian? According to the U.S. Census, yes. So when you think about someone from China and you think about someone from India, do you think they're the same race? If you were to just Look at basic biological traits, skin color, things along those lines. So you're going to find that our racial categories don't accurately code people. Because India is pretty close to China, right there with the Himalayas. Cross those and you're in China. Russia is very close to China. Cross the Gobi Desert and you're in Russia. Why is it that Russians are white? Chinese people from China are Asian. And people from India are Asian. Why isn't a Russian person Asian? And also, Europe is also on an Asian landmass. So I'm always wondering about that a little bit. Is Europe even a separate continent, or is that also part of Asia? And then you got to think about all the blending that's happening globally. That's always happened. How many times has Europe been conquered by the North Africans, by the Romans, by Persians, by... Genghis Khan coming out of the Gobi Deserts of China, <laughs> okay? Just north of the Great Wall is the home of Genghis Khan, who then comes over to Europe. Hannibal comes up on elephants, you know? So again, you have to be asking questions about how many times people have been blended. You know, the Greeks went down and fought the Persians. The Persians came up and fought the Greeks. Darius and Xerxes and Cyrus, they all came up. And on the way, people were mixing the whole time. We've had great trade routes. Globally, we were interconnected, you know, prior to the great ice wall flooding in 10,500 BC. So the Christopher Columbus, you know, discovering Native Americans, I mean, again, people have been there the whole time. And then people from Africa have been going to Latin America and people from Asia have been going to North America. And that's been happening for tens of thousands of years. Again, this is not the first time humanity has been globalized. How much of a percentage of Neanderthal do you have in your blood? I love, like, the Nas watch the National Geographic uh, episode on Neanderthals, and I just love that, that we all have, you know, 2-3% to Neanderthal, and a lot of our immunities and our art and things like that come from the Neanderthals, you know? So, again, was Michelangelo so good at painting because of the Neanderthal in his blood? Because Neanderthal in the blood has the highest concentration around northern Italy, for example. So, again, it's just you got to be thinking about all these questions, okay? So, again, we're looking at what does it mean to be a minority? So, again, a minority is someone who has less power over their lives than other people. Women are the most oppressed majority of all the minorities, even though they have a majority population. Again, because women historically have had less power over their lives less life chances than men. Okay, and then in the United States, who has had a dominant position and who's had a subjugated position? Okay, how did whites get 
privilege? How did whites gain that kind of power? And then how were Native Americans subjugated? How were Asians subjugated? How were African Americans subjugated? How were Eastern Europeans subjugated? And all the other groups that have been subjugated in the United States. Okay, so we need to be understanding how this all came about. And again, we're in sociology, we're studying society, we're studying groups of people and social interaction, and we're looking at a historical perspective and wondering how it got this way. How are things changing from time? How is racism different than it was in the 1950s, than it was in the 1860s, okay? How has our perspectives of people from Asia changed from the Chinese Exclusion Act of the 1880s to the present, for example? So again, we're going to be looking at different minorities, different minority statuses, different groups, how that affects people, but specifically we're looking at race and ethnicity, okay? So we're going to be looking at biological differences. We're going to be looking at ethnic differences, including culture and religion and language, okay? So again, in this class, we need to be opening our minds and having the tough conversation because a lot of things that I've suggested already is seemingly maybe a little bit radical. Um, but again, you're going to watch a great video on how to have the tough conversation because look, white is not a race. Black is not a race. The Supreme Court says very clearly that white is not a race. White is an ethnicity. And really, white is a pan-ethnicity. It's a grouping of people from all over the world, from Russia to Europe, to North America, to South America, to South Africa, to Australia. It covers all the continents, Antarctica, the Arctic, okay? It's an ethnicity that covers the whole world. Hispanic is not a race. It's a grouping of people that share some common ethnicity. Hispanic is a pan-ethnicity. Asia is like almost half the planet in population. It's a pan-ethnicity. Where does Asia end and Europe begin? In Russia? North Asia? And the west side for the Baltics and Eastern Europe? You know, so there's a lot of questions that we have to ask in this class. But again, a lot of it's radical. To suggest that your racial category that you identify with, that's part of your identity, that's part of your personality, is a social construction and is not based upon scientific facts or evidence is a really tough thing to suggest. For me to say you're not white, you're not black is a tough thing to suggest. But again, I bet you've never heard of racists like mulatto, African Panamanian, Honduran, Honduran is not Honduras is a country, but Honduran is a race. Mestizo, okay, these are races in Latin America. You wouldn't hear them here in North America because we only recognize four: white, black, Asian, Native American or Native Alaskan or Native Hawaiian, other. But in Latin America, because things are so blended down there, they have something called the color gradient. So it's all based upon how, how light-skinned you are, how white you are. And if you look at your history books and you look at the leaders of Latin America for the last 200 years, the goal of leadership in Latin America was always to whiten yourself, to lighten yourself, because that suggests status. Now, our attitudes toward race have changed. Okay, again. In 1980s, there were 500,000 interracial marriages. Now there's 10 million. What's going on? Why do we still need social movements, though, even though things have gotten better? Because racism, prejudice, discrimination still exist. And you can easily discern where these areas are when you look at things like hiring practices. You want to really look at institutional discrimination, look at managers and hiring practices, for example. You know, do white sounding names like Emily get the call back more than black sounding names like Latasha? And the research says yes. So again, we have to be constantly talking about this because things are not equitable yet. Yes, things have improved, but that does not mean that racism and prejudice and discrimination are gone. Now, there are two plus more methods for ending racism. One way to end racism, racism in general is just to stop identifying with races. Stop socializing your children that they have a race. Because in nature, people don't just come up with, I am black, I am white. 
It's not a natural phenomena. It's something that we as a society, symbolically interacting with each other, socially constructed so that one group could have power over another group. And again, if you go to Africa, racialist, you cannot go over there with American races. Because if you call someone in Africa black, that is a swear word. That is a derogatory term. They do not like color terms and they do not identify with being black for example. So you have to be quite aware of what culture you're referring to when you call yourself and somebody else black or white. Black is very offensive. When you go over to Asia, they don't have races like we have in the Americas. Ideas like black and white, this is an American trend. It's not a global or a universal trend. To them, like in India, it's are you Hindu or are you Muslim? Race is based on religion. Okay, you could be sheik also, but it really, those are the majority was Hindu, and then the minority is Muslim, and then Sheik. But the Muslims were very oppressed, just like in America, African Americans, and Native Americans, and Asians were very oppressed. So the Muslims moved out of India and created a new country called Pakistan because they didn't want to be ruled by the dominant majority of Hindus. So again, race in different places is very different than it is in the Americas. So again, some of this stuff is challenging. You might never have heard about it. But again, guys, the way I got into it was I read in a Latin American history class the word mestizo. And when I read the word mestizo, I was like, I got to look up this word. What does this mean? It means European mixed with Native American. And how many in America are blended in such a way? So am I biracial? Do I have two races? And again, it opened up Pandora's box to am I actually white, which then led to the idea that um, I'm not actually white, and white's not even a race. White is an ethnicity, for example, okay? So a lot of the stuff we're talking about might be new, and it's new to me, and it was new to me, and so I had to really delve in and figure out what's going on here and take a sociological perspective to understanding the intersection between race and culture and social class and where you're located in the hierarchically stratified social system that's divided into groups that can be ranked. Okay, so that's a quick introduction to what is race, what is ethnicity, what is the social construction of race, how did race come about, what's the origin of race, what's the purpose of race, okay? What does it mean to be a my, my minority, having less power over your own life, okay? So that's just a quick introduction to some of the things we're going to be studying, and then we are going to be delving into a lot of the subjective experiences of what it's like to experience life having a race or identifying with a race or identifying with an ethnicity, for example, okay? And then again, you understand the origin of inequality. It starts with difference, then the meanings that we attach to those differences, and then the social actions that we take to rank groups hierarchically, okay? So for this week, you guys are going to work through the start here section. So make sure you guys open up start here. There's a great video. If you want open up, what is this class about? Watch this video on race and ethnicity. What's most important from here, after you guys have read through all these other tabs, such as what materials do I need? How do I get uh, deal with the, you know, call IT if you get locked out? Uh, extra time for completing assignments, plagiarism, how to submit my assignments, on anything you guys need technical. Um, you guys are going to have to take this getting started quiz, so make sure you take the getting started quiz. Then what is extremely important for this class is registering for the inquisitive. So you need to open up this inquisitive and go over how to use inquisitive, inquisitives, okay? Then you're going to do introduction discussion board one, talking about who you are, what's your major, uh, what group are you most looking forward to examining, hobbies outside of school, and something interesting about you. This enables us to interact online, and it really, this class, the stuff that comes out of it, the things you guys end up writing are incredible. I mean, after reading the papers from this class, some of the ideas that you guys will be covering, just I'm always so impressed with the students. So I'm super excited to read what you guys are writing and to delve into some of these ideas with you, possibly for the first time. And again, I know this might be a challenging class for you, um, and some of the ideas are challenging, but once you start delving into race and ethnicity, it really does make you think about things, you know? And so, um, please email with any questions, and super excited to work with you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much.